My name is Yvette Briggis, and I work in our people operations team, and I'm really excited to introduce Dr. John Ioannidis. Uh, John is a professor of medicine, health research and policy, and statistics at Stanford. So not just one, but all of those. Um, he's also the co-director of the very recently launched Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, also known as Metrics, which is a research to action center whose purpose is to advance excellence in scientific research. Previously, John was chairman at the Department of Hygiene and Epidemiology at the University of Ioannina School of Medicine in Greece, as well as an adjunct professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. John is best known for his research and published papers on scientific studies, particularly the 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. I can't understand why that one was controversial, um, which has been the most downloaded technical paper from the leading open access medical journal, the Public Library of Science. Uh, John's current work is focused on improving research design standards, and today's talk is titled Reproducible Research, False or True. Uh, the talk is being live streamed and recorded, so we ask that questions are held until the end and that you wait for a microphone so that everyone can hear your questions. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Ioannidis. Thank you, Iveta. Um, I would like to share some thoughts with you, and I realize that it's a videotaped uh, talk, but this doesn't mean that you should not interrupt. Actually, please do interrupt, because <laughs> otherwise it's going to be a very boring uh, lecture, I presume. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here to share these thoughts with you. So um, science is, uh, is a big enterprise. Uh, we're talking about 15 million people uh, that have published papers indexed in scopes in the last 15 years. And uh, this is about 25 million papers. Now, I'm sure that uh, Google Scholar has better coverage, but I couldn't find the exact numbers for that time period. Any, any guess? Maybe it's 30 million that have at least one item listed under uh, Google Scholar. So how many discoveries do we have in science in these last 15 years? Major discoveries. Maybe a few thousand? I, I, I see two. <laughs> OK, I'm an optimist. I think we have several thousand, but, but really not 15 million uh, discoveries. So far less than one per person on average, probably one in a thousand or one in 10,000 or maybe one in a million, depending on how you look at that. Self-correction should work. So uh, even though we don't make big discoveries all the time, uh, we find small pieces that may be correct or wrong and we can correct them if they're wrong. Um, the ability of self-correction is considered one of the main features of science in a cumulative meta-analysis framework. If sufficient time elapses, then we will get to the truth eventually. But the question is how quickly do we get there? So uh, of course we corrected that the Earth uh, uh, is not the center of the world and the sun is not going around uh, the Earth, but it took us about 2,000 years to do that. So uh, an issue of efficiency arises on how we could do that faster. Uh, uh, Self-correction is often not happening promptly enough, and it may be impeded by destruction of evidence, production of wrong evidence, or distortion of evidence. Here's the possibilities of what could happen when we have a new uh, discovery being proposed and efforts to replicate it. We have the optimal path, which is that the discovery is correct and the replication is correct. The self-correcting, the discovery was wrong, but the replication was correct. The false non-replication, the discovery was correct, but the replication was wrong. The perpetuated fallacy, discovery was wrong, the replication was also wrong. Um, unchallenged fallacy, discovery was wrong, and replication was not done, because people didn't think that they should do it. And unconfirmed genuine discovery, the discovery was correct, and uh, the replication, again, was not done. Now, different fields have different profiles of these six options in terms of their frequency and prevalence. Um, and I'm going to show you some data from uh, psychological science. This includes a lot of disciplines. And uh, it's summing some empirical studies that were published last year, well, late 2012, a year and a half ago, in pers perspectives in psychological science. I was asked to summarize all these empirical studies uh, on one paper in that same issue. And here's how it looks like. The, the optimal represents less than 1% of that literature. The self-correcting, again, less than 1%. False non-replication, far less than 1%. Perpetuated fallacy, 2%. Unconfirmed genuine discovery, 43%. And unchallenged fallacy, 
there's a lot of uncertainty in these numbers. It could be better than that. They could be worse than that. Um, yes? <laughs> okay, uh, good, good question. Based on what we see uh, whenever we do take an extra step to, to do that. So uh, the, the only way to discriminate r rigorously uh, between these categories is when we do have an effort at replication. So psychological sciences in general have a culture that replication is not really very um, uh, advantageous for pr the promotion of someone's career. But many other scientific fields have developed some replication culture, and we have more evidence on how frequently results get, do get replicated. When we have empirical evidence um, in fields where replication practices are common, then most of the time, most of the initially claimed statistically significant effects are either false positives or substantially exaggerated. And here's a few examples. This is uh, um, genetic epidemiology where for many years we were running tens of thousands of studies in the very same way that we continue to do research in most scientific fields. We had a hypothesis. In that case, we thought that one gene may be related to some disease, and we were testing for that. And we were coming up with papers. I have published lots of such papers saying that that gene is associated with the risk of um, major depressive disorder, smoking, acute coronary syndrome, osteoporosis, coronary artery disease, da 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 da. And then we have a revolution. People realize that, uh, well, we're not really making much progress. Uh, how about joining forces? Instead of each one of us publishing a small study, we can have lots of studies coalescing into consortia. And we can <coughs> measure the whole genome instead of one snip at a time. By doing that, we have the ability to try to see what happened to all of that literature where we thought that we had identified 57 loci for major depression, 359 loci for smoking, and so forth. And this is the replicated gene loci in that new agnostic uh, testing arena. The replication rate is 1.1%. So 98.9% .9 of the original discoveries were not reproduced. And this is pretty much the, the mode that most scientific fields, especially in biomedicine at least, are still working at one hypothesis at a time, or a few hypotheses at a time, or publishing one or a few hypotheses at a time. This is one other field. This is um, nutritional epidemiology. And uh, this is um, uh, an apples and oranges meta-analysis. Actually, it's not an apples and oranges meta-analysis. It's uh, uh, a wine and tomatoes and tea and sugar and salt and potato and pork and onion and many other things meta-analysis. So what we tried to do, we took a cookbook, literally, the Boston cookbook, and randomly selected 50 ingredients. And we asked the question, for how many of these 50 ingredients that you can uh, eat that we just had lunch, for example. We, several of them were probably in what I ate. Um, how many of them have scientific studies claiming an increased or decreased risk for cancer? What would be your guess? 48. 48. OK. Uh, very close. Uh, we found 40. Uh, actually, the other 10 do have studies, but we just uh, searched in a way that we tried to find the exact ingredients. So for example, vanilla was not among the 40. It was among the 10 that we didn't find a study. But if you search for vanillin, which is within vanilla, you would have found studies trying to associate vanillin with increased or decreased cancer risk. And, and this is the effect sizes. This is the relative risks for different types of food ingredients. And this is for different types of cancer. And r these are relative risks of um, decrease, if it's less than one, or increase per roughly one serving per day. So if, if you take literally a 0.5, it means that with one more serving per day, um, you can half the burden of cancer. Of you know, one, one more serving of uh, tea, for example. You, you cut, uh, according to that study, you cut cancer risk by 60%. Um, one more serving per day here, uh, so potatoes, one more serving per day, you double the risk of cancer. So, uh, around the world, one more serving of potatoes per day will double the cancer risk around the world. How many of these estimates do you think are close to reality? You know, and, and let's say reality plus minus 5%. <laughs> OK. So very, very few. And most likely, it's the ones that are very close to that line of one. Um, I'm, I'm a professor of uh, medicine in, in, in disease prevention, so I do believe that several of these foods do affect cancer risk. 
And I think that it also makes sense to try to promote, for example, fruits and vegetables, uh, or to decrease, uh, for example, I think pork has mostly bad studies there, and you know, red meat probably has increased cancer risk. But the best studies, the ones that are least biased for fruits and vegetables, suggest that with one serving per day, we can have a relative risk of 0.998. So it would be almost indistinguishable to that vertical line of one. But it is a benefit. And if you translate it to a global population, it would mean tens of thousands of people who would be spared for, from cancer if we do that. Uh, but it's not a 0.5. It's not a 2. It's not a, a 0.7 or, or a 1.3. Here's one other field pharmacoepidemiology. Here we had the benefit of having access to the data on prescriptions for many years and on cancers over many years of an entire country, Sweden. Sweden has amazing registries and our colleagues uh, Christina and Young Sundquist at the University of Lund do have access to these databases. So what we did here, we just did an analysis. We are trying to associate all medications against all cancer. There's about 2,000 different types of medications. We group them into 550 something uh, clusters because there's several beta blockers, for example. And here are the results as p values. This is minus log 10 p value for different um, categories of uh, medications. So these are classes. And uh, three out of four medication classes may affect cancer risk. I did this analysis. I think it's correct. Um, well, who knows? Uh, but do you believe that this is sensible, that three out of four medication classes uh, would increase or decrease cancer risk? Some of these p-values, this is 100. It means a p-value of 10 to the minus 100. Zero point uh, da da da. Yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing number. I mean, in terms of statistical significance, you cannot get any better than that. But in fact, it's very likely that very, very few of these medications affect cancer risk. What is happening here is we're facing big data with lots of confounding. You know, even if you run the very best analysis, you will see lots of that confounding coming to the surface and giving you signals right and left. Each of them could be a publishable paper. You know, I, I think we can publish a few hundred papers out of that uh, project alone, uh, or probably none. Now, more replication. I think if, if we have replication in additional data sets, some of these problems will disappear. Well, you will not see it again and again, uh, unless you have the same biases appearing again and again. Who's going to do that? Well, the industry recently has been a challenge asking for more replication. I have been surprised, because many years ago, I was struggling to convince that we need to replicate some of the classics of, for example, drug interventions. And the industry was very defensive on that. But now, when it comes to preclinical research, uh, colleagues from um, several companies have tried to reproduce academic research done in the very best centers by the very best scientists, and trying to see if I have preclinical drug targets that have been published in the top journals, can I reproduce these results? Because I want to use these results to be able to develop my new drug to become the new blockbuster. So this is how it looks like. Very, very bad replication rates uh, by several teams at uh, Amway and Bayer and other companies. Um, 70 to 89% non-replication. For the Amgen project, only six of the 53 landmark studies could be reproduced. And that was even after asking the original investigators to specify exactly what they were doing to, to get these results. So the conclusions. In that paper, for example, in Nature a couple of years ago, that the failure to win the war on cancer has been blamed on many factors, but recently a new culprit has emerged. Too many basic scientific discoveries are just wrong. This means that hedge funds often don't trust science nowadays. Um, this is a statement from a, a journal that I don't read routinely, but it, um, it's in the interface of business and science. It says that at least 50% of published studies, even those in top tier academic journals, cannot be repeated with the same conclusions by an industrial lab. And the potential for not being able to reproduce academic data is a disincentive to early stage investors. At least one venture capital firm, and, and now there's far more than that, is hiring uh, contract research organizations to independently validate academic science prior to putting up serious money, which, which means that th this is bad news for me as a Stanford professor. 
it, it means that my work, I, I'm doing that maybe for fun, to get promoted, to get my next grant. But you know, if you really want to trust my work, find someone else to repeat it. Otherwise, you cannot take it for granted. I need to fight back to regain my reputation. I think it's extremely important that I don't leave that perception to be floating around. Some countries are probably even worse in that regard. And this is a, a piece of work that I, I did with uh, Dan Fanelli and came out uh, about six months ago in PNAS. We use data from two extremes. One is genomics, where measurement is very accurate, and the other is uh, psychology and psychiatry and behavioral sciences, where the measurement is pretty subjective. And we ask the question, is there more bias in one field versus the other? And is there more bias with extreme results in studies coming from specific countries versus others? What we found, number one, there is bias, probably. Small studies tend to give exaggerated results, which are not seen in larger studies in both fields. But when it comes to subjective outcomes, like behavioral sciences, then the US studies are for, far more likely to find extreme results. Why is that? One might argue that maybe there's more pressure in the US, or at least this is reflecting studies done on average a few years ago to several years ago. Uh, maybe for an academic investigator, there's more pressure to deliver a significant finding, an extreme finding, in order to get it published in a major journal and continue to get funded. I think this has become probably a global perspective at the moment, but maybe when we analyze these data, uh, it was far more prominent in the United States. Why research findings may not be credible? It, it, is there something wrong with science? There's nothing wrong with science. I, I think science is the best that we have as human beings to understand the world, to understand ourselves, to understand uh, what is happening and what might happen in the future. Uh, but unavoidably, there is bias. And also, there is random error, which means lots of comparisons being done. And usually, there's plenty of both. And the question is, can we dissect these two forces and minimize them? Um, how many biases are out there? I don't know. I, I, I'm considered to be an expert on bias, but I had no clue. So I was trying to create a list of bias. And when I meet, met David Chevalarias a number of years ago, he said, why don't we have the computer read the entire PubMed overnight and tell us how many biases uh, we can identify. So, so this is a galaxy of biases. It's uh, 235 biases mapped across 17 million PubMed papers. I have to say, I had never heard about a third of them. And I'm considered to be an expert. How many of these biases do I think ahead of time when I design a new study? Probably very few. But this doesn't mean that they do not exist. So um, even methodologists cannot really anticipate all the biases that may occur. This is a time array for biases slide. Uh, it shows how popular they are in the literature, how many people are talking about them. So if you see white color, it means that they're hot. People are discussing them. Uh, here's an error, 1882, um, one of the many errors probably I have uh, made. Um, and if you see black, it means that no one is interested. There's no papers discussing that bias. However, even when people are discussing about bias, so for example, confounding is the most common bias term in the literature. And since the late 1970s, it has been discussed by many, many papers. What do people say about confounding? Uh, every epidemiological paper in the discussion will say, confounding is a problem with epidemiological studies. However, our study does not have that problem. Because you know, we did a very good job in, in, in whatever way. Yes? Could you briefly explain what confounding means? So confounding means that uh, you have some exposure that is related uh, both to the risk factor that you're interested to study and with the outcome that you're interested to, 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 to study. But it, the effect does not go through the risk factor that you want to study. This is the official definition. Practically, it means that the two groups that you're comparing to try to see if the risk factor has an impact on the outcome are unbalanced in important way in regard to that confounder. The confounder is not the same in those who have the risk factor and those who do not have the risk factor. Um, so it's, it's the main reason why in the analysis of the medications, for example, I see that 3 quarters of the classes of medications have an association with cancer risk. It's confounding. Uh, confounding by indication in that case, most likely, and other types of confounding. But most of the times that we discuss bias, we do that to try to say that our study is protected. Same thing for publication bias. Publication bias is a very popular term in meta-analysis. 
Almost every meta-analysis, if you read the discussion, it says publication bias is a threat to meta-analysis. However, our meta-analysis is probably immune to that or not affected because we did X or Y or we think that it's not a problem here. In many cases, when we have the benefit of multiple studies that try to replicate original findings, we see that correction of the bias. So these are genetic associations that were proposed uh, many years ago in leading journals. And when they were proposed, they were highly cited papers. They were highly statistically significant results. But as we did more studies on the very same association, the cumulative odds ratio gravitated towards the null. And at the end of the day, at the latest update, there was no longer any signal that was even nominally statistically significant. However, to do that, you need a replication culture. You need a situation where people are willing to perform these additional replications. And as I said, this is not very frequent. This is a view of the, uh, yeah, question. The, the graph, the last slide, is that possibly explained entirely by regression to the mean and not by publication bias? Or any other bias? So the question is whether uh, this behavior would be attributed also to be a, a regression to the mean. Um, it could be to some extent. And, and some of these uh, diminishing effects could be regression to the mean for some effects that are genuine. Uh, but inflated when we first discover them. And I think I'll show some examples about that. In most of these cases that I show here, I think the, the most likely scenario is that they were just null. And you know, we're chance findings that we perform replication and they go away. But the possibility of regression to the mean is there for, for, other, for other situations. Yeah, uh, the, the, what is the difference between the two is that in one case, there's absolutely nothing. And we have an exaggerated result that reflects a completely null truth. Uh, and the second possibility is that we have an exaggerated reflect, uh, result that reflects some truth partially. That there is a signal, there is a true signal, but it's not as big as, as we have found. So qualitatively, it is different. In, in one case, there's nothing. In the other case, there is something. In terms of the magnitude of the effect, if you look at the exaggeration, it could be equally big in, in both circumstances. This is another empirical evaluation looking at the creme de la creme of uh, clinical research. Uh, what I've looked at here is the studies that were published in uh, uh, any medical journal and have been the most cited in the literature. So those that got more than 1,000 citations. And trying to see whether additional studies were done down the road to see if they would replicate uh, what the original studies had proposed. Five out of six non-randomized studies could not be replicated. You know, they, they were found to be either completely wrong or grossly exaggerated. And about 25% of randomized trials were also found to be either completely wrong or grossly exaggerated. And, and this is the creme de la creme. This is the most influential clinical research. And this is the type of uh, non-replication rate that, that we witness. Uh, randomized means that um, this is clinical research, so we want to see whether a drug or a lifestyle change or whatever is effective in reducing mortality or cardiovascular deaths or cancer or whatever. So we randomly create the two populations that will get the intervention or not get the intervention. So, so it's the best way that we can study interventions because it's uh, as unbiased as it can be. The, the two groups are generated by chance. And therefore, they should be similar in terms of whatever other characteristics they have. If they're not similar, then we have the potential for confounding that we were mentioning earlier. So much of the time, what we get is what I would call excess significance bias. P people want to get significant results. And the ways to do that are manifold. But at the end of the day, they boil down to three different mechanisms. Results that become positive while they should have been negative. Results that are negative that are being suppressed, never published, not visible. And fake positive results are being created out of vacuum. You know, there's no data, there's no patients, there's no information in, in reality, and someone creates a fake paper. I don't think that the third mechanism is common. Uh, you know, scientists are, are not sense, but, but uh, I think that on average, we're a very honest bunch of people. And, uh, uh, you may see cases of fraud coming uh, to the forefront of the news, uh, but I think this is a very uncommon scenario. I, I don't think that someone would waste uh, their whole life to be trained as a scientist to, to be a fraudulent uh, manipulator. But results that are negative, that are suppressed, are probably not uncommon. And I think this first mechanism, results that 
are really negative when the original intention, what was the original protocol, the original hypothesis, they do become positive by changing that analysis, by adding an extra layer of exploration to the data set. I think this is probably pretty common. At the end of the day, the common consequence of all these practices is an inflation in the proportion of observed positive results. And that means that one would have too many studies with significant results. That would mean even seemingly replicated results on the same question. Too many significant results is not necessarily a sign of replication. It could mean something is going wrong here. And um, here's one indirect insight into this. This is uh, another paper by uh, Dan Fanelli where uh, there's a sample of papers evaluated across different scientific fields. And the conclusion is that fields that have more rigorous um, research practices and more rigorous criteria for claiming discoveries, like physics and space science, for example, they have the lowest proportion of statistically significant results in their literature. Conversely, fields like psychiatry, psychology, clinical medicine, pharmacology, toxicology, material science, they have about 90%, sometimes more than that. There's some papers that, some journals that only publish significant papers. You take a whole issue and it's only significant papers there. They have 95% or more sometimes significant results that they get published. This is just too good to be true. And the question then is, what do we do with that? What, what solutions might we have? And I will discuss a few of these potential solutions in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes. One is to learn to live with small and tiny effects. Uh, I know that maybe this is not very attractive to say in Silicon Valley where everybody says that, oh, we have the new major discovery of the future of the 21st century or the third millennium or whatever. Um, yes, that, that would be great, but most of the effects, of the genuine effects that we are going to find and document are going to be pretty small. Uh, this is an empirical evaluation of um, risk factors and interventions with tiny effects meaning odds ratios less than 1.05. I think many of those are real. And actually, in many sciences, these tiny effects are likely to be the majority of them. Uh, in biological sciences, I think most of the effects to be discovered are likely to be very, very small, maybe even smaller than 1.05. One of them alone is not going to change the world. But a 1,000 of them, if we can combine information from a 1,000 tiny effects, we would get more than a major discovery. So we may just need to realign our expectations about what we're chasing. Second possibility is to uh, try to rigorously replicate whatever large effects we find. If you are talking about single studies, large effects are pretty common. So this is an empirical evaluation where we looked at uh, half of the medical literature for clinical trials. Uh, we used data from 220,000 clinical trials worth of data that had been included in 85,000 meta-analysis in the Cochrane collaboration, uh, Cochrane Library. And this covers any type of medical intervention. How often do you think, across this whole medicine evidence, do we have interventions that pertain to mortality risk? They reduce mortality risk by fivefold. So if 10 people were to die, only two or fewer are going to die. Significant results at p-value of 0.001 or less, and no clear evidence for huge bias that you can easily discern. So this is the entire medicine, more or less, 220,000 randomized trials, or well, to be exact, about half of it. How many medical interventions can do that? Decrease mortality fivefold and have really strong support from clinical trials. Any guess out of the 85,000 meta-analysis? Close to zero. Close to zero. We found one, so not zero. There's a few more, and I said this is not the entire medicine, and there's some interventions that have never been tested in clinical trials. So um, insulin for diabetes, it was discovered before even randomized trials were discovered. But really, there's very, very few that achieve such huge benefits and are well documented. Extracorporeal oxygenation for premature babies. Um, it does have such a huge effect. Um, so uh, the question that one has to ask is how much vibration of effects is there in the results that I see? By vibration of effects, I mean how many opportunities have there been in the background of that result to be obtained? 
has there been only one analysis that could have been done, or is it multiple analysis? Maybe people have cherry-picked what analysis they wanted to present. And this is a manifestation of the vibration of effects in grand scale. Um, that's a study that I did with uh, Shirag Patel and Melinda Burford, where we tried to evaluate different risk factors for mortality in NHANES, which is a, a large uh, database from uh, a household heart survey in the US. And we asked the question, can you get different results if you analyze the same data differently? And for each one of these data sets, we have analyzed the same association, the same risk factor, in about a million different ways. And this is the cloud of the results, the p-value and the hazard ratio that you get for death. There's lots of risk factors like uh, vitamin E here, alpha tocopherol, that you can get this shape, which suggests that depending on how you analyze the data, you can get a result that suggests that alpha tocopherol increases mortality, or you can get a result that shows that alpha tocopherol increases mortality. So you can get decrease, increase, no effect, whatever you wish. If you're a believer that alpha tocopherol should do X, you can get that X. I mean, just play with the data and, and you'll get what you want. Another possibility is to promote large-scale collaboration. So I showed you the example where we thought that we had found 359 gene loci that regulate smoking behavior. When we decided to join forces and perform a very large study, a consortium study, with very rigorous statistical methods and look across the whole genome, we found only four. And actually, all, none of these four was one of the 359 that we thought uh, would be there. So we killed 359. We found four. Uh, since we published that study, the number is up to seven that have been well documented. Uh, is that bad news? I would say this is good news. We have seven now that we know are genuine. They have very strong statistical support, very rigorous replication across all these teams that have joined forces. Reporting of research could also make a difference. Many papers are very difficult to understand what is happening. The methods are very sketchy. The results are fragmented uh, and forget about the discussion. So there's lots of efforts, and all of these have been brought under the umbrella of the Equator Network, uh, led by Doug Altman in Oxford, uh, trying to put together all these efforts to standardize reporting of research results of different types of designs. Registration, I think, could also make a difference. Um, you can think of studies being registered ahead of time, rather than just wait for studies to appear out of the blue. You know that a study does exist. And I think that the, the major problem, as I tried to describe in that paper in JAMA, is not really papers on studies that exist. I worry mostly about studies that don't exist. And you may think that I'm paranoid. But let me try to explain by why I fear studies that don't exist. I fear studies that could potentially exist if someone were to spend the time to create that study. So if you have a data set, there's millions of studies that could be created out of that data set. So what I would like to know is really what data sets are out there and what could be done with these data sets. What is the potential? It's like mapping nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, none of them has... Uh, uh, been sent. The missiles are not sent to, to target yet, but it's good to know that there's 10,000 missiles that could be launched at some point. And these are the different levels of registration that you can think of for any scientific study. Level zero would be no registration. It means that no one has registered that idea or that protocol or that data set or whatever, and here it comes. I've never heard about that, that it was happening. Fine, let's keep it. But it means that we need to replicate it. Otherwise, it's very, very unlikely that it would be true. Some of them would be true, but not very high chance. Registration of data set is what I described. We know what data sets and opportunities exist. Registration of particle, it means that we have started formulating a hypothesis. If we do have a hypothesis, then people would know about that. Registration of the analysis plan is different than registration of particle because the analysis plan is an extra level of detail on how exactly the data are going to be analyzed. And even seasoned analysts acknowledge that uh, the analysis plan may really change down the road. Registration of the analysis plan and the raw data, which means that if people have time to waste, they can go back to the raw data and try to repeat that analysis and see whether they get the same results. And finally, open live streaming, which means that I do my research, I open my computer to public view, and uh, you can start sending me messages. Jo John, don't push that button. Don't run that chi-square test. It's the wrong test for this data set. It's very silly. Or your whole protocol is wrong. We've done that before. You don't need to repeat it. Do it this way. 
some fields are experimenting with these options. And I'm not saying that all fields should adopt open live streaming. But I think moving more from zero, level 0 to level 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 may be beneficial. Yes? Is, is the point of registration then that you get the criticism earlier and save people time? Uh, the question is whether by registering you get the criticism earlier. Part of the, of the benefit is that. But I think that uh, uh, there's also more transparency. So in a way, registration would help cure some of the publication bias problem. Because people would know that even though I see one study that is published, there's 30 studies out there. Where's the other 29? I need to go and find the results before I make some conclusions and start policy actions based on the one that is published. So I think that there could be many benefits at many layers. And obviously, if you have a good sense of what the research agenda looks like, funders or other scientists may decide that here we have 50 studies already. Why do we need yet another one? So it, it, it could be a multiple level of, of uh, benefits. This is an empirical evaluation looking at how common data sharing is in different scientific journals in, in, the, in the articles that they published. Uh, we looked at the 50 highest impact factor journals um, across science. And we tried to see if they have policies in place for sharing of materials, of protocols, of raw data, and also whether it may be a prerequisite for publication. And if you see green color, that, that's very good news. It means that these journals do have policies in place for different aspects of the sharing process. But the last column, which is very tiny font, you have to trust me that there's lots of zeros. And these zeros are the number of papers out of 10 that we screened in each one of these journals that actually adhere to these policies. <laughs> So th there's lots of sensitization about these issues. But when it comes to real life, it's very difficult to find the raw data. And even if you want to waste your time to repeat the analysis, it's not really doable. So if you want to waste your time, what would you get? Um, a few years ago, I, I gathered a number of colleagues uh, who are very interested in microarray analysis around the world. And we got in touch with uh, Miles Saxon, the editor of Nature Genetics. And we said, your journal has been visionary. This is true. You have a policy in place that data should be shared in public as a prerequisite for publication for microarray studies. So let's try to see whether we can repeat the analysis in specific tables or figures from microarray papers published in Age of Genetics. Impact factor of 40, one of the best journals across any scientific field. And this is what we did. Out of 18 papers that we tried to repeat the analysis, we could repeat the analysis only for two. And for the others, we could reproduce with some discrepancies. We could reproduce from process data with some discrepancies. Could reproduce partially with some discrepancies. And in the majority, we could not reproduce at all. And, and the reasons for that, the databases were not available, actually, even though they were supposed to be. Um, software uh, were not available. They were homemade and had disappeared. The methods were unclear, so none of the experts in the team could understand what was happening. Or uh, people could understand what was happening, but uh, we got a very different result. So, so this is one of the highest impact factor journals, one of the most transparent journals, uh, researched by the very best teams. And repeatability is 2 out of 18, a little bit over 10%. The other question is, who's going to do the replication? Um, would it be the same investigators? Uh, would it be different investigators of the same school? Would it be different investigators of competing theories or hypotheses? Combinations of the above? Would it be open to the wide public? Anyone, especially if you have these raw data sets available in public view. I think the results and the replication profile could be different depending on who is replicating. And all of these ideas are, are currently really being debated. It's, it's, it's a very hard debate about what type of reproducibility we need. And there's lots of in initiatives that are um, appearing around the world to try to do that. So for example, Brian Nosek has launched the Center for Open Science focusing mostly on psychological and social sciences, uh, reproducibility and reproducibility. The reproducibility initiative has started replicating the most highly cited research in cell biology. And it has an open initiative also for other studies to be repeated by independent labs. Um, as Iveta mentioned, uh, we recently launched uh, with uh, Steve Goodman Metrics, the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford, which we aim to try to coalesce all of these efforts around the world on different aspects of reproducible research and research on research. Uh, so anyone who might be interested to join in that effort, you know, please send me an email or um, find a way to reach me. 
If I don't respond immediately, please, I apologize, but uh, sometimes I get overwhelmed. Uh, but uh, we're very excited about probing different possibilities about how to promote reproducible research. Uh, to do that, maybe we need to change the reward systems and the incentive systems. Uh, if, for example, funding agencies, all they want is significant results and claims from major discoveries, this is what they will get, significant results and claims for discoveries. If we realign the incentives both for funding agencies and for institutions and for research institutes and for companies to get translatable results, results that you can make sense of, that you can apply, that you can get something out for the real world, uh, reproducible results, uh, high quality results, this would be a very different story. And uh, one note of caveat, I don't want us to reach the other end of the spectrum, the other extreme, just having too much wasted replication. Here's one example. This is uh, uh, an interesting topic. This is uh, statins for prevention of atrial fibrillation after cardiac surgery. Should one use statins in that setting? Good question. I would like to know the answer. There are randomized trials about that. There's also meta-analysis about that. How many meta-analyses are out there? There's 11 meta-analyses when we publish that paper. I think there's 14 now. Uh, why do we need 14 efforts to perform a meta-analysis on these data sets the, within three years, practically? They all get the same result. The first one was inconclusive. But after that, they all got the same result. So some broader picture of what is the research agenda looking like may be helpful to avoid wasting resources for performing the 15th meta-analysis on the very same topic. And, uh, allocating resources more wisely. And this is another caveat. We have to take into account a changing world. Um, this is another field that uh, we recently looked at. This is uh, genetic meta-analysis. And uh, the different bars here represent uh, genetic meta-analysis from different countries. The blue bar is not the US. The blue bar is China. So in that field, China went from 1% less than 10 years ago to about 60, 70 percent of the entire global production in English language high impact factor journals or good impact factor journals. That's interesting. I do believe that China is really the new giant in science, and I see that in many different fields. We took a closer look to see what's happening here. So we looked at these papers. In terms of reporting, they look great. They, they look wonderful. The, the tables are very meticulous, very well structured, the details about the methods they're very nice, wonderful, but almost all of them are wrong. Uh, why is that? Because they depend on collecting fragments of published information on specific genetic associations. So pretty much the same literature that I showed you in one of the early slides. These are meta-analysis compiling the small pieces of information that are published. They cannot take into account the very large initiatives that have data sets that are 50 or 100 times larger and conclusively find null results for these associations just because they're not available. It's not their fault, but they just gather what they can see uh, under the lamppost. And, and what they can see under the lamppost is very limited, fragmented, and, and potentially highly biased. So, to conclude, I think that there is a very large number of conscious, unconscious, and subconscious biases that can operate in the research process. Um, this is likely to be just human nature, and uh, we should take that for granted. We should just try to see how we can work through that. Re replication and reproducibility practices vary a lot across different research fields. Uh, and I think that the adoption of these practices can be key to the success rates, efficiency, credibility, and legacy of each field. Uh, fields that are non-credible can become highly credible. Others that are credible can lose their credibility depending on what practices they adopt. And I think that it's, it's a huge research area to understand which are really the best practices to improve our credibility rates. Uh, I just want to thank a few of my colleagues that have been involved in some of the empirical studies that I showed you today. Uh, since I'm famous because most of my published research findings are wrong, uh, they should not be blamed for that. I, I think that the part that was wrong is mine, the part that was correct is theirs. Thank you. Back to where you had all those studies where they continue to produce inconclusive results. That would suggest to me that there's somebody out there that wants to find a result, and they keep trying to find that result. Is that how you see it? Absolutely. So the, I, I think that there is a lot of confirmation bias. Uh, if, if people have developed a theory or they have a field that is expecting to find 
some associations or some effects or some results, and they don't see that. They will just keep analyzing the data or keep accruing um, other research efforts until they get that result that they want. Um, I, I think this is very risky because it, it creates bubbles of, of scientific disciplines. I, I think that many scientific disciplines are just bubbles like the candid gene uh, association bubble that burst when we had better studies, larger studies with, with more careful characterization of both the genome and, and better sample sizes. Uh, how common these bubbles are, I think it's open for debate. Um, I think most scientists would be defensive that their own field is not a bubble, uh, but I, I, I suspect that there's many bubbles out there. While there's certainly a bias towards publishing positive results, how can we account for the fact that um, there's probably also a bias for testing relationships um, for which there's a plausible mechanism in the first place? So we're not just testing random predictors on our outcome, but rather um, things that we could believe plausibly or scientifically that would influence that outcome? So uh, I think that there is room for incorporating plausibility, biological plausibility, and other lines of evidence in designing studies. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, everything should be agnostic. And in many cases, we have tons of previous evidence that we need to take into account. So for example, if I were to design a, a large-scale randomized trial to test a new treatment, probably I will not take any treatment to be tested. I will take one that has gone through preclinical research, early clinical research, early phase studies, phase one, two, and it shows promising results all along. So by the time I get there, I have incorporated all that previous evidence and decide that this is a good study to do, to, to have the conclusive result of whether it does really work. However, in, in most circumstances, in my experience, and in a number of empirical studies that we have done, uh, biological plausibility is inflated. It's, uh, it's over-interpreted. Uh, people use biological plausibility in ways that suit their, their needs. And much of the time, it is post hoc. Uh, they find the result, and then they draw the circle around it. Uh, uh, and it's interesting. Any result can be explained away as being plausible. Uh, I, I cannot think of any result that someone cannot summon biological plausibility. So how do you solve that? I think you need registration. You need to have registration of a protocol that says specifically, this is my hypothesis and this is what I base it on. This is the plausibility argument or arguments that I have. And let's see what happens. And, and then it's a good choice. And if, if it's a nice result, that's great. Wh whatever the result is, then it's, it's, it's valuable. Uh, Professor, based on your uh, research, would you say that uh, science currently is undergoing a crisis of a sort? I mean, g given, given the number of papers that are you know, simply wrong. Is, is science undergoing a crisis? And, um, and, it, and, it, and if so, so how urgent would you say it, it is to fix it or do something about it? It, it depends on, on how you define crisis. Um, if crisis is synonymous with uh, we have been infiltrated by millions of fraudulent people, no. Uh, if uh, crisis is that our efficiency is very low, uh, I would say yes. I think that the efficiency of, of many practices of conducting research currently is very low. We have a lot of waste. If you see that as, as a machine, the machine could operate far more efficiently. Uh, and the question is, what are the best interventions to improve that efficiency? In, in a series of papers in The Lancet, along with several colleagues earlier this year, we estimated that the waste in biomedical research is about 85%. So is that a crisis? I, I would argue it's, it's a very high percentage. Some might argue that, well, that's not bad, 50%. I, I mean, uh, you know, it could be 1%. I, I, I think I'm an optimist that I believe that that 15% could become 40% or 60%. It's unlikely it will become 100%. You know, science is very difficult, and even under the very best intentions, we will keep making lots of errors and lots of suboptimal choices. But I think we can get that 15% to a much higher uh, range, and I think that this is true for many other scientific domains, even beyond biomedicine. Um, have you or anyone else looked into at what point in the research process results become wrong? So uh, do they typically have, do studies typically have poor designs or do the samples get mixed up or are there bugs in the software or maybe the data is correct and wrongly interpreted? Uh, do you have any sense of that? So what is the stage that most studies get it wrong? Uh, it's a continuum. It, it, there's multiple phases and each phase has its waste contribution. 
And, and there's waste contribution even from selecting the study to perform or the, or, or the question. You know, there's lots of studies that just have no rationale that should be done. Um, if, if someone says, I'm going to do another meta-analysis on statins for prevention of atrial fibrillation, I will say, well, we have 14 already. Why do we need a 15th? Uh, so, but I'm sure that there will be one, probably in the next few months. Uh, there's then a lot of waste in the design. There's lots of waste in the conduct of the study. There's lots of waste in the analysis of the data. There's lots of waste in the reporting of the data. There's lots of waste in the post-publication or post-publication uh, interpretation and use and uh, implementation of the database or whatever they mean. It, it's not just one point. So it hasn't been quantified. Can you say that you know, a quarter of papers are wrong because of a software bug? Um, it has been quantified for specific subsets of, of, uh, of scientific fields. So it, I, I think it would be misleading to say that uh, all fields are suffering more from one of these five steps. Depending on the field, you may have more waste in an early phase or, or a late phase. Uh, what does this research lead you to think about the role of journals? Um, Certainly, they've come, sort of come under criticism for the fees they charge people to access them or things like that. Uh, do you see journals as kind of driving change here, or is this something where there are things in addition to or instead of journals that are getting these, like the registered studies or other information out there? Journals can be a very influential stakeholder in the whole process uh, because they control much of the reward and incentive system. Um, so this means that they can make things far worse where they can make things far better. One example where they make things far worse is where you have journals that are willing to accept practically anything, uh, hardly with any peer review. There, there was that hoax that was published in Science several months ago. Uh, 300 journals were sent a paper that was a fake paper with all the errors that you can imagine, and half of them accepted it. And another 20% were thinking of, uh, they were still you know, considering it. Um, they can do things much better. Uh, so, for example, registration of clinical trials would not have been successful unless all the major clinical journals had agreed that we're not going to publish a clinical trial unless it is registered. But people had been talk talking about registration for ages. I, I remember the 1990s, BMJ had come up with a nice idea about a trial amnesty saying, if you haven't published your results, you know, we will forgive you, you know, come out and tell us what you found. You know, nobody came out to tell what they found. Uh, but if BMJ and JAMA and Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine and all the major specialty journals said, we're not going to publish your work unless it's registered, then it did happen. It creates new challenges. Now that we have registered studies, we see that, well, there's other caveats. So you can still register a study, but the protocol may not be very transparent. Uh, there's still lots of leeway for vibration of effects and for exploration of the analysis that you want to present. So now we need to work on that. How, how do you get journals to buy in that you don't need to just register a study and say, oh, yeah, I'm doing a study, but really be precise about what is being done and how it's going to be done. So journals are a major stakeholder. They could really affect the, the whole system enormously. Yes. Uh, so with many hypothesis tests, it's very simple and well understood how the power and p-values change as a function of sample size. So I was wondering if there are any inferences you have from distributions of sample sizes and p-values. Like, is there a big cluster of p-values just below 0.5 when you, or 0.05 when you look across these studies, for example? There, there are several studies empirically that have looked at different fields and they find that there is a, a concentration of p-values very close to the 0 0.05 uh, <laughs> magic number. Uh, most of that work has been done in the psychological sciences, and there's a, a big hump uh, just next to the 0 0.05. Uh, in my experience, when we've looked at different data sets in other fields of epidemiology, we see a hump uh, next to 0 0.05, not necessarily less than 0 0.05. It could be like less, but also slightly higher. And these are papers that have what we call spin. So people get a, a p-value of 0 0.07, but they say, oh, we found an association. Uh, you know, 0.07, it's the same as uh, 0 0.05. Uh, but, you know, 0 0.07 could be 0 0.08, 0 0.010, uh, 0 0.12. Um, so th there are attractors in the p-value distribution, and this is highly visible, especially in fields that have a very long tradition of working with specific thresholds that claim who is the winner. Even in fields that have rigorous statistical thresholds, for example, genome-wide association studies, um, we have accepted that instead of a p-value of 0 0.05, we need a p-value of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. You still see a hump 
very close to the 5 times 10 to the uh, minus 8. Um, but at least you hope that, and empirically it shows, that most of these values that are very close to that threshold are replicable. So uh, in contrast to those that are just in the 0 0.05 uh, threshold. Uh, maybe following up on that, uh, do you think we make the problem worse by focusing on the wrong statistics? Uh, maybe we shouldn't focus on p-values at all, but rather have confidence intervals over effect size. Uh, possibly. So uh, for a long time I have argued, of course, in favor of uh, effect sizes and uncertainty around them. Uh, I, I have also suggested that many other colleagues have done the same, that it would be better to use Bayesian approaches in presenting and interpreting results. However, I, I want to be honest. I don't think that changing the inferential rules from a frequentist approach, let's say, to a fully Bayesian approach, um, will necessarily cure these problems. For, for example, if you embed into people's minds that a, a base factor of 1,000 is what they should be looking for, people will just try to get a base factor of 1,000. I mean, they, they were trying to get a p-value of 0 0.05. Now they will try to get a base factor of 1,000. The one difference is that the base factor of 1,000 would be something that would be more directly interpretable. And, and, and it, it would be easier to understand what it means um, for, uh, for other purposes, rather than for the bias of twisting the analysis to get a result passing the threshold. All right, that's all the time we have for questions, but I think Dr. Enidis will be around for a little bit to answer questions. So let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.